Russia come out and say that they are going to start to accumulate platinum, palladium, and silver. It's the first time I've ever seen a country actually mention silver in, in terms of their, their stockpile. You know, we see them accumulating it. We see China accumulating it. We see India accumulating it. None of them ever made a, a declaration that indeed this is what we are doing. And so when you realize that these countries have been accumulating in, in, in massive quantities, where, as I said, uh, you know, China's buying unrefined silver from directly from the miners paying double what the West will in, in Latin America, so they can bring it home and refine it. And it's, it's kind of off the exchange as no one sees it. This is emblematic of what we should expect to see all around the world. And now you have a country come out and actually say, we're going to start accumulating silver. It's the first I've seen of it, but. Andy Schechtman, how are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good, to, good, man. It's good to be back. Good to see you. Uh, it's a crazy time though. You know, it's, it's a crazy time in every, in every respect. I kind of call it like the quickening, man. Since I've seen you uh, down here uh, at the, at Rick rules conference, it just seems that time is accelerating. Uh, events are accelerating. And here we are two weeks before the BRICS meeting and three and a half, four weeks before the election. And these aren't uh, dull and complacent times. You know, the Chinese curse, brother, may you live in interesting times. These are indeed interesting, but it's good to be here. I appreciate you having me back. I couldn't say I couldn't say it better, and there isn't a person I'd rather talk to than you right now. Um, everything that you've talked with me, as well as to other people you've been preaching the gospel of, has just been really. We've been moving towards that, um, and it's been accelerating, which is exciting but scary, and yeah, all of that. True. And I don't know how to exactly process it, but it's uh, we are we're going through it right now, and so I want to start working that out with you here. Um, let's start with an announcement, uh, that Putin made just, uh, I don't know if it was 48 hours ago or 72 hours ago. It was just really recent about how he's, uh, starting to make it a priority for them to acquire other metals. Let me get your comments and take on that. And then let's move into the BRICS meeting that's going to happen in about two weeks. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that is. What I have witnessed over the last couple of years, and you're right, it is scary. You know, I, I've been doing this for a long time. No one ever tells you about the things they got wrong. And certainly I've gotten plenty wrong. But seeing the crumbs that have been laid at my feet and everyone's feet since 2019, 2020, putting them together, going out on a limb publicly and saying it and watching it happen has, on one hand, been kind of exhilarating. Yeah, I got it right. On the other hand, it's very frightening as a father of three kids watching the world unfold in in less than an ideal manner um and as we take a look at everything unfolding we see the central banks as you mentioned who have been buying gold and silver at a level really the world's never seen before much of this accumulation has been done kind of on the sly you look at and i'll get to your your question but i want to lay the foundation you look at saudi arabia they they got caught uh, importing 160 metric tons of gold, didn't report it to the IMF, but the import-export numbers caught it coming out of Switzerland. Oh, we made a mistake, so to speak. China has been buying gold for as long as, um, you know, as long as I've been doing this for 35 years. And, and all along, their numbers were stuck at 1,200 metric tons. Everyone said you can never believe anything they say. Then they start accumulating more over the last 18 months, 18 months in a row or whatnot of, of positive figures in accumulation. And then they stop for a few months and, and everyone's saying, look, the Chinese have stopped. No, they haven't. They, they're buying it through a proxy bank like the, the, the PBOC uh, uses commercial banks to buy directly from the refiners in South Africa and Switzerland. That doesn't get reported to the IMF. If the PLC, the People's Liberation Army buys on behalf of the, the country, they don't report it to the IMF. China's flying all around the world buying unrefined dore bars and, and, and um, concentrate in silver, uh, paying double what the Western uh, refiners or the Western companies will pay for it and bringing it back and refining it themselves. That doesn't get uh, accounted or, or reported to the IMF. And so when we talk about the amount of, and by the way, China is the second largest producer of silver in the world. And so all of these countries, and Russia included, not only do they 
understand the importance of, of commodities in this new system we're moving into, where he or she who has the commodities makes the rules. But they're also trying to accumulate more than they're letting on to in a very big way. India has imported 850 million ounces of silver over the last couple of years. And you got dig, 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 dig to try and find it. They've probably imported a lot more. And so what I'm getting at is that to see a country like um, uh, Russia come out and say that they are going to start to accumulate platinum, palladium, and silver, it's the first time I've ever seen a country actually mention silver in, in terms of their, their stockpile. You know, we see them accumulating it. We see China accumulating it. We see India accumulating it. None of them ever made a, a declaration that indeed this is what we are doing. And so when you realize that these countries have been accumulating in, in, in massive quantities, where, as I said, uh, you know, China's buying unrefined silver from directly from the miners, paying double what the West will in, in Latin America, so they can bring it home and refine it, and it's, it's kind of off the exchange as no one sees it. This is emblematic of what we should expect to see all around the world. And now you have a country come out and actually say, we're going to start accumulating silver. It's the first I've seen of it. But, you know, you look at an exchange like the LDMA, Andy, and, you know, it's the most, it's the, the most widely traded exchange on the planet. 8.1% of the entire silver float was delivered off the exchange in the month of August. So these countries are also draining our exchanges by using the suppression of the Western paper market in an effort to drain the exchanges. And this is something that, that I think you will start to see accelerate in a, in a meaningful way. You will begin to see, um, the, the silver market. Sorry about that. Every time I start a podcast, my dogs want to say hello, but you will begin to see things happen like central banks openly admitting that they are taking possession uh, of metal and, and purchasing it, let alone the opaque manner in which they've been doing it all along. And people will wake up to this realization that, my goodness, these players have been buying for a long time when it finally comes out that it's obvious. Because if you were trying to reposition yourself out of dollars and treasuries like we're seeing, and instead of recycling into treasuries, recycling into commodities, it would do you you probably you're you, you you're doing yourself a disservice to tell the world about it. You want to accumulate as much as you can before we see this revaluation, before we see the drive to accumulate metals. And you could say the exact same thing about the West. Now, I'm not saying we're accumulating it, but why don't we ever talk about how much gold we have at Fort Knox? Why do we not audit it? Why, when Ron Paul wants to audit it, is it shut down? So, I guess what I'm saying is. All of these countries have vested interests in keeping, uh, you know, quiet about the real numbers. They want to let us on to, yeah, we're getting some, but this is the first time I've seen a, a central bank come out and say silver is now going to be accumulated as a priority and in an asset that I view as the most undervalued on the planet, for real, on every level, supply, demand, uh, and, and increased usage in green, digital, military, you name it. It's a big deal for silver. It's a very big deal for a market that is trading massively, massively rehypothecated where on the LBMA, and I'll shut up and listen to what you have to say about this, but on the LBMA, they have openly admitted recently that, look, they say we have 800 million ounces of silver, of which 500 million belong to the ETFs. 300 million is the float. It's the lowest amount they've had since they've started keeping records ever. And this is a 140 year old exchange. I don't know how far back their record keeping going uh, goes, but but what I am saying is they openly admit to trading 292 million ounces of silver per day of 300 million every day, five days a week. But the interesting thing about that number is they also say, well, you know, it's that number's ten times understated because um, we only report the final settlement numbers, not all the trades that it took to get there. And so you're talking trading 2.9 billion, with a B, ounces of silver per day, three and a half times annual global mine supply, which is 90 plus percent paper sold by the bullion banks that have a vested interest in suppressing the price and have for a long time. And these countries, namely India, Russia, and China, have realized it doesn't take missiles and stealth bombers to beat the United States. What it takes is accessing the back door that no one ever did. No one ever stood for delivery my whole career. Nobody did. And now 
we see 8.1% of the entire silver float on the LBMA delivered in the month of August. How much longer, when they tell us it's the lowest amount they've ever had on record, how much longer can they take that? And this is why those countries who know what we're doing, they understand what we're doing, even the new BRICS grain exchange, the guy who's running it said, you know, we produce and consume more wheat than the West does, but the price is controlled on COMEX. And when this new exchange is in place, that will change. They know what we're doing on all of the world's commodities. We control it. We suppress it. We can make oil negative 40 a barrel like we did in 2020. All of this plays right into the hands of the global South, who's using that suppression and other means and now openly talking about it. Uh, to drain the shelves of what is, I think, the most important thing in the world to do, and that is to accumulate co commodities in favor of treasuries. And, and we're seeing that happen in a massive pace. Yeah, and that really, really you'd well said, and you've answered probably 10 questions right there. <laughs> um, but really what I want to know then is this meeting that's coming up. And again, who knows? And you don't want to it's the meeting happens and I, I don't expect them to just reveal their playing cards if you would and make an announcement. But that being said, it is an important meeting. What would you say is the importance of that meeting that you would say and what's going to come out of that? And again, I'm not saying that this is the event that crashes the dollar or anything like that. But what what is the importance of that meeting? Yeah, you know, a lot of people were expecting a common settlement currency to come out of the bricks in uh, Johannesburg last year. And I had the good fortune last year at Rick Rule's meeting to spend a couple hours on a boat cruise uh, drinking cocktails with James Rickards, who at the time said that that would happen. And he also said that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union would join the BRICS. I've said that for three years, never put a time frame on it, but I said all three of those things indeed would happen. Now that none of them happened. And he's not wrong. Even the head of the president of, um, Oh, uh, gosh. What, what is the, pre the president of, um, it'll come to me in a moment, called for a summit uh, to bring the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union into the BRICS. The president of, I can't believe I'm having a senior moment. It'll come to me halfway through this presentation. But one of the presidents said, yeah, this should happen. And it will happen. And the BRICS will issue a common settlement currency. Uh, it didn't. What was said in, in uh, last year in, in Johannesburg, Belarus, there it is, the president of Belarus said, let's get these guys, these two organizations. By the way, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is the largest regional financial and military organization in the world, which Iran and Saudi Arabia have recently joined. And the Eurasian Economic Union is all, all the con former Russian or Soviet countries and end in Stan, like Kazakhstan. They're all in this, and they're all really tied together very incestuously. They'll all end up joining the BRICS along with most of the folks in the Belt Road Initiative. Anyways, I digress. So what came out of that meeting was they said, look, let, let's all go back to the drawing board and let's come back to the meeting in Russia in October next year and present our findings on a common settlement currency. In the meantime, let's all trade in local currencies. And we've seen that. We're seeing Russia, uh, or excuse me, China buy corn and soybeans from Brazil and instead of uh, United States and Australia, where they canceled much of, much of their contracts. And they're paying for it in the yuan, which is immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. What is gold? It's the only other tier one reserve asset as reclassified by the Bank of International Settlements. Let's remember the BIS in this, in this discussion here, because the BIS does things in a very cryptic way. And, and you know, the BIS is really, I think, behind a lot of this stuff. If we go back to, I'm going to get to your question again, but I like to backfill. Sure. If we go back to 2017, the Bundesbank in Germany out of nowhere said, give us back our gold to the U.S. and to the Bank of England. And, and it was weird because gold had fallen for six years in a row. They had been trying for two, three years, finally made a big stink about it. It was an article in the Wall Street Journal. Shortly after that, Austria, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, Czech National Bank, Dutch National Bank, they all said the same thing. Yeah. And then in 27 or 18, those same banks bought more gold as a group than they did in the 60 years previously combined and doubled it in 2019. And then coincidentally, the BIS said, yes, gold is now the only other tier one asset. So obviously they were clued into what was coming. So let's fast forward to where we are now. Um, we have this meeting now, you know, after a year of trading rupee for ruble and, and, and yuan for 
for, you know, corn that's then traded back into gold. I mean, they're trading with one another outside the dollar. That is for sure. And we can see this accelerating, right? The largest contract, uh, um, a huge contract in Iran to modernize their biggest airport was awarded to China. They're paying for it in oil. Gold and oil have been remonetized and are certainly worth more than the currencies that purchase them. And let's keep that in mind too, as we go forward anyways. So about three, four weeks ago, coinciding with the G7 meeting in Italy, the BRICS had a meeting. They've had up to 200 meetings beginning of the year, leading up to this big meeting in October. And there was one in particular in Novograd, Russia, where the crown prince of Saudi Arabia was invited to coinciding with the G7. He was invited to that as well. He told the folks in the West, eh, can't make it, busy, and then sent his finance ministers to the meeting in Novograd. Three things came out of that meeting that I would like to discuss as it pertains to what will we hear next week. And uh, number one was that we find out that 59 countries have formally thrown their hat into the ring to join the BRICS. 59. That doesn't mean that 59 will immediately be uh, accepted. Right. We'll find out if any or which ones they are and if indeed they have been accepted. They keep stuff really close to the vest. But more importantly, what we saw was an admission by a woman named Delma Rousseff. Delma Rousseff is the former president of Brazil, and she's the head of the BRICS New Development Bank. This is no small fry. This is a very, very important woman. And she came out and said, look, I had two meetings on the sidelines with Sergei Glazyev and Putin. Now, I've done 5,000 videos since 2019 talking about the BRICS, and all of them center around a new currency because Sergei Glazyev has told us that in numerous numerous occasions that this is what they are hedging towards a, and he would say a basket of commodities and a basket of, of BRICS plus currencies. Well, interestingly enough, the meeting between Sergey Putin and Delma Rousseff, she claims has been agreed upon in principle. In principle, they have agreed upon a new settlement currency called the unit and the unit will be traded over project M bridge. Let's start with project M bridge. I've talked about it for over a year now. It is a cross-border payment system designed by China, Hong Kong, United Arab Emirates, and Thailand. And it allows for these countries to trade with one another in central bank digital currencies outside of the ability of the SWIFT system to screw with it. And if you take the world's gross domestic product, Andy, and give it a percent of 100%, 99, the countries that comprise 99% of that uh, GDP globally all have a CBDC in operation or development. And so CBDCs, unfortunately, is where we are moving to. In fact, our country does as well as the number two economic advisor to the U.S. White House, Lael Brainerd, modern monetary theorist, used to be at the Boston Fed and helped develop the CBDC with MIT when Biden fast-tracked it and when he first got into office by executive order. So CBDCs are coming. And if you look at the first trade that was done last year, I talked a lot about it. It was a test trade between China and the UAE. China bought gold and oil on the two trades using Embridge, their, their digital yuan. And I do believe gold and oil are being remonetized. They are comprising more and more and more in the way of trade settlements outside the dollar, right? So we see that Embridge, first and foremost, and, and what Delma said is, this will not be a common BRICS currency. Everyone will have their own central bank digital currency. Everyone will be in charge of maintaining their own um, monetary economy, keeping their house in order and, and not worrying so much about the United States, but their own ecosystem. Each country will have to maintain, you know, prudent economics. But for settlement, if they want to settle in something outside of, I have enough rupee, I have enough ruble, I have enough, you know, yuan, I'd like to go in a different direction and I'd like to take the settlement currency. It's called the unit. And she said, this has been agreed upon in principle. It too will be traded over Project Embridge, and it is a basket of 60% BRICS plus currencies, as Blasiev has told us, Three. no more than 30% of any one currency comprising the basket. But instead of a basket of commodities, which would be too hard to balance all the time, and, you know, wheat goes bad, and, you know, how are you going to do it with oil? And So you're just using gold, which is what? The only other tier one reserve asset as defined by who? The Bank of International Settlements. Well, guess what? The Bank of International Settlements is standing behind Project Embridge, and guess who the fifth full-time member now is on Project Embridge? The fifth full member, full participant, is Saudi Arabia. They are now the fifth 
full participant. And guess what? The dollar is not compatible with Project Enbridge. So you have a situation where the largest producer of oil, the linchpin of the dollar hegemony, the head of OPEC, in essence, is now a full participant in Enbridge. We have about 30 other countries that have signed up in terms of observational participant. We're waiting to see how it all shakes out, in other words. So you have China, Hong Kong, UAE, Thailand, Saudi Arabia, which, with backing of the BIS. Now, remember what I told you about how all these countries had brought their gold home and then went on this big buying spree. And then coincidentally, the BIS says two years later, by the way, gold is the only other tier one reserve asset in the world. Hmm, that was interesting and coincidental. So a simple Google search, if you look and see what are the countries that have brought their gold home in the last several years, here's just a small list and, and it's not inclusive, there are others. But in the last year and a half, we've seen Germany, Austria, Slovakia, Argentina, the Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, Hungary, Belgium, <laughs> Egypt, Senegal, Romania, Nigeria, Poland, Ghana, India, Turkey, France, Serbia, Czechoslovakia, South Africa, Cameroon, Algeria, Venezuela, I could keep on going. All of these countries brought their gold home from the New York Fed and the Bank of England. Now, for years, countries would leave their gold at the New York Fed to give direct access to the COMEX. They would leave their gold at the Bank of England to give direct access to the LBMA. Safe Western jurisdiction, Western rule of law, all of these things that enabled these exchanges to be the biggest in the world. Side note, over the last six months, the cumulative volume on the Shanghai Metals Exchange and the Shanghai Futures Exchange has grown by over 400%, surpassing the COMEX. It is now the number two most actively traded commodity exchange on the planet. Keep that in yep. mind. So anyways, the conventional wisdom with all of these countries bringing back their gold is that it's weaponization of the dollar, weaponization of the treasury market. We have stolen $5 billion in treasuries from the Russians and, and, and you know, used it mostly in the form of weapons to give to a country they're in the midst of a war against. It's a line you don't come back from. You're supposed to be impartial, right? We can say, Janet Yellen can say to CNN, listen, you know, we're okay with Xi being friends with Putin. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. After all, you know, they're in bricks together. We're okay with that. But if Xi gives one penny to the Putin war machine, we'll sanction their banks, their companies in Beijing itself. Never mind that we've given F-16 Stinger missiles, 200 billion with no congressional oversight to the Ukraine because we don't matter. We're the reserve currency. Now, this doesn't sit well with much of the world. This is the, the rallying pride that's making everyone look away from the dollar, amongst other things. But that's the, that's the big one. And that's most people would say, well, that's why they're all bringing their gold home from the Bank of England and the New York Fed. That's part of it. If you read the white paper on the unit, as I have, what you see is, is them addressing the issue of, of monopolar world versus a multipolar world. Monopolar world says the Federal Reserve is the center of the universe. This, this, this multipolar world says, wait, wait, wait. Instead of having a BRICS common currency, we're all going to have our own CBDCs and maintain the integrity of them. Trade over Enbridge, right? But if we want to settle outside of that and want to have something different, uh, maybe I have enough of your Rupal or your Ruby, or I just want the new settlement token. That's called the unit. And the unit will, as I mentioned, 60% currency, basket of, of the BRICS plus currencies, not more than any one currency being 30% dominant, and a basket of gold, the only other tier one asset. But here's what it says. It says those items will be put into an escrow account within the, the, the you know, and audited continuously, both the gold and the currency, independently audited within the countries that possess the metal. In other words, they're all bringing in home. India, as an example, bought one and a half times the amount of gold they bought all of last year in the first four months of this year, shipped it home. Yes, last year was a record year for them. And they also brought home 100 metric tons they've had at the Bank of England since 1991. So in other words, they will make their own settlement token by putting it into an escrow account in their own borders. They don't have to send it to Beijing. They don't have to send it to Moscow or Dubai. They all hold it themselves, have it independently audited continuously, with great penalties for deviation from the ecosystem that allows them to make these tokens. And remember, it is deliverable in kilo bar form. So will they come out and make this announcement? If they do, it's, it's a god awful experience for the dollar because what it does, if you look at gold, Andy, it's doubled the performance of the 10 year treasury over 25 years with no counterparty risk. These countries are not dumping treasuries because that's not smart. They let them roll off their balance sheet. Instead of repurchasing them, they are recycling the proceeds into gold and silver and other commodities. And they've been doing this methodically for a very long time. 
So if you realize that the dollar is being eviscerated with money creation and the treasury market has been weaponized, well, geez, what do you think? Does it make more sense to buy an asset that's doubled the performance of the 10-year treasury, has no counterparty risk, and will be the foundation? By the way, it's the only other tier one reserve asset in the world and will be the foundation of a new settlement currency. And instead of buying treasuries and dollars, you just accumulate gold and take care of your own ecosystem. Now, it doesn't matter if this gets announced next in the next two weeks or not. Yes, it would matter if it did, but the cat's out of the bag. And we can see this is the direction that they are going. This de-dollarization is leading to this moment. If they do announce it, bang, that is the lighting of the fuse of the end of the dollar's dominance. We've already lost the hegemony. We lost that when Saudi Arabia said that we're, you know, we're not going to re-sign an exclusivity deal a month and a half or two ago. We'll still take dollars, but we're going to take other currencies too. The supremacy is still here for now, but you start to move down a road where all of these nations Every OPEC country on the Belt Road Initiative, many of them joining the BRICS, they're all in the same group and they say, you know, we're done taking dollars. It's over because the synthetic demand for the dollar that has been created through all of these years of having to stockpile it, it would have a massive reverberation if everyone started to dump them in favor of accumulating gold and other items because that's just the way the world is moving. So we will see. I, I don't know if it will happen. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they talk a lot about it. But to your point, they may not lay out their full playbook just yet. I think one of the things I respect the most about the BRICS is that they do things methodically and they do it right. It's been 18 years, man. So this isn't just a brand new shotgun experiment. Yeah. A couple of comments. And then uh, another question is basically Simon Hunt, who well, you're aware of, as well as Zoltan Pozar. We'll all talk. Yeah. So do I. But they share your sentiments. Um and I mean, you've just dove deeper into it with me. So I appreciate that. But they, you're no longer the only one saying this is what I'm trying to say. So you got some good big people uh, on your left and your right on this. Um, my second comment or I guess question would be, what do you see as the next shoe to drop? And again, this is no longer plotting so much, even though there is some of that, meaning connecting the dots, but it's already there. We're already seeing it. So what's the next shoe to dot, I guess, to be connected that you see in the near term? I just, I guess we're kind of in that, you know, I mean, I live in Florida right now. I hate to use this metaphor, but we're kind of in the eye of the hurricane. Mm -hmm. um, it's quiet. I don't know what the next shoe to drop is, of course, but if I had to guess, It'll be something here domestically. You see, there are a lot of people who would tell you what's happening is too stupid to be stupid. Or at least I'm that lot of people. And a lot of these things seem to be in an effort to promote this reaction in a world where are there coincidences or not? I'm not really sure. But when you realize that, you know, first of all, by Biden signing an executive order to go green, you're basically giving the middle finger to the linchpin of the hegemony to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, thanks for the memories, guys. We're going a different direction. By weaponizing the dollar and the treasury market, you are incentivizing everyone to think twice. Are we next? By creating $100,000 of debt per second until your fingers fall off, a uh, trillion dollars every 90 days, that's a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. By destabilizing the dollar, the treasury market, signing an executive order to go green, or well, following the playbook of the lead economic advisor, Jared Bernstein, who advocates for this, the removal of the reserve currency, privilege we can no longer afford. This nitwit has a degree in music and a master's degree in social work. Uh, but I digress. But you then look at what's happening here with the overleveraged banks in particular, right. undercapitalized, and then look at What's happening in the cities, the lawlessness, the, the 30, 25 million people in this country illegally, the, the Oaken borders, the, the lack of respect of our immigration policy, questioning of the judicial policy and questioning of the electoral process. Are they fair? Is it two tiered? All of these things that whether or not people watching this believe that the elections are rigged or not, or that there's a two tiered justice system doesn't matter. Half the world questions it. Half the world wonders why we are uh, valuing people based upon their lifestyle rather than their merit. You look at FEMA right now, their number one goal is to, uh, to do, uh, how do they call it? Um, uh, uh, equality in, in helping people. I mean, everything is about equality instead of equal opportunity, it's equality. And this, this wokeness, this, this 
evisceration of our culture, whitewashing of it, is not lost on the rest of the world. You put it all together, something is bound to break. Now, are we incentivizing it? Are we? Do, is this what we want? Do we want to find a villain? Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC, how could they do this to us? Is that an easier path to take than falling on the sword for brain-dead um, monetary policy and fiscal irresponsibility? I'm not sure, but you couldn't draw it up any better if you wanted to lose the reserve status and lose the respect of people around the world. Sign an executive order, go green. Uh, um, um, weaponize the dollar in the treasury market. Um, massively inflate the dollar away and create with irresponsible fiscal policy a hundred thousand in debt per second, 24 seven, and then let your country fall apart and make everyone say, what the hell is going on over there? Massive divisiveness, all of the things we see, afraid to go walk after, after sundown in a big city. These are the things that never happened in this country. And these will all affect the decisions of the rest of the world. And you know, does that, you know, how does it affect even here domestically a bank when the cities are falling apart and all of the businesses that sprung up around it, these banks own 70% of the commercial real estate and 70% of the small business loans who small businessman is getting killed. And these, these, these businesses that spring up in the big cities around the, the hotels and the, and the, and the big buildings are now ghost towns. So as all those people leave, it becomes harder to get revenue to run your city. It's not as safe. There aren't as many good services like trash removal and, and police and fire. So people start to leave as the quality of the life disintegrates. And then more businesses fail as a result of this and more people leave. It's an urban doom loop. This will affect the banks. So is that what they want? I mean, the number two is Lael Brainerd. She developed the modern, she's developed the CBDC. She is a modern monetary theorist. Is this what they want? Do they want to reset the system? Do they want to blame it on those guys for, for, for letting the system you know, how can they, how could they stop taking dollars? I don't know, but I do know this in my gut. I feel there will be an event. There will be another shoe to drop and that shoe will probably accelerate the ultimate trend of de-dollarization. But the question is, does it happen in Russia? Does it happen here? And not to mention how close are we to world war three? Why is the head of, 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 um, NATO going to into the Ukraine saying, I won't rest until the Ukraine is a member of NATO. Why are we doing these things? Right. Why are we trying to continue through this proxy war in the Ukraine? Why are we continuing to hedge closer and closer and closer towards World War III? I don't know, but I will simply say this is either our politicians are ridiculously stupid or everything that we see around us is too stupid to be stupid and it's planned. One or the other, but I will tell you to expect there to be smooth sailing between now and the end of the year, I think is a long shot at best. And I don't know what it is, but it's coming. Something is. That I do believe. Yeah, I believe that too. Andy, I think we're going to end on that. Uh, give us, uh, how do people get in contact with you? And by the way, Andy Shekman and Miles Franklin have the best reputation in the industry mm -hmm. by, uh, uh, by, by far. So, but if people want to get in touch with you, follow you on Twitter do business with you? How do they do that? Yeah, we, uh, we do have a Twitter accounts, Miles Franklin, I believe. Um, we have, I just started and, and I'd like to have you on too, Andy. I just started my own podcast and, and, and uh, we've got some great guests coming up. I'd love to have you as one of them. We have uh, Johnny Bravo, Greg Manorino, uh, David Morgan, did one with G. Edward Griffith. We also do a, a weekly Q and A that's on Miles Franklin uh, YouTube channel and we're growing pretty quick and uh, just started doing that about a month and a half ago, and um, they can always email us. So we prefer to keep our prices, our special price list, non-public. Uh, we keep it close to the best. So the best way for people to find out about what we're doing at work is to send us an email at info at milesfranklin.com. Say you saw me on Andy Millett's show and that you'd like to see the price list, the special price list, no obligation, none. And it will be as good or better than anywhere in North America, those prices. Any questions that you have, regarding about anything we've talked about or any questions you're dying to ask us, put them in there. Uh, if you want to be contacted, put your phone number down and uh, do check your spam as well, because sometimes when a corporation like ours sends an email, a lot of people's spam filters will grab that and put it in the junk file. So make sure you check your spam filter, but info at Miles Franklin, milesfranklin.com, our YouTube channel, Miles Franklin. And then, of course, on Twitter as well. So, uh, Andy, I do appreciate it, brother, very much. I look forward to picking up where we left off real soon. Uh, 
maybe have you on my show if you're up for being on the other side of the microphone. And uh, look, in a world that's changing as fast as this one is, kind of like a roll of toilet paper, you know, it used to go real slow. Now it's starting to go faster and faster and faster. You see the cardboard. What does the cardboard mean? I think we'll have a better understanding of what that means, maybe even by the end of this year. So you want to talk about it? I'd love to jump back on with you and pick up where we left off, brother. Anytime. As always, it's a good, good to see you. Anytime, anytime. I also want to share anecdotally, I was uh, at a luncheon in Florida with Andy Sheckman, and a lot of people in the room were doing business with Andy, and it was nothing but good things. So um, just so everybody out there knows. Thanks, Andy. You got to run, man. Um, but I just can't tell you how much I enjoy my time with you. Thank Likewise. you for all your insights. And uh, yeah, I'd love to be on your show anytime. Awesome. You'll hear from me. And, uh, you know, I'm here in Southern Florida at the, at the bo bottom southeastern tip. It's already getting real windy and we're not even in harm's way. Uh, I'd like to say a prayer for all the people who've already been affected by Eileen uh, in North Carolina and, and Florida. And uh, Godspeed for the people in, in Tampa and in the direct uh, path of this. We're a couple hundred miles away from anywhere near the epicenter and there's already probably 50 mile an hour winds here. So, and it's not even really it yet that's coming tonight. So uh, prayer out to all those people. And uh, to you and everyone else, man, uh, stay well and look forward to chatting with you soon. God bless you. Amen. See you, man.